Well, praise the Lord. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our church experience this Sunday. We are so excited for you guys to be here today. Um, as some of you are coming in, we want to welcome the, our online viewership. If you are here watching from your home in your PJs still, we want to say welcome. We are so excited you're, you've decided to tune in and watch us today. Um, but we're just blessed for, that you all are here today. And I want to say welcome and thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. Uh, my name is Pastor Joshua. This is my wife, Pastor Christina. And we just want to say welcome and thank you and happy Sunday. It's a good day. It's, today is the day that the Lord has made. And today we're going to rejoice in it. Amen. 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 So you might have noticed that our, our chairs and our aisles are a little more distant. So we want to um, encourage you, as Pastor Josh mentioned last week, to adopt a row. So the reason we've spaced the chairs is not only to give you lots of space to clap and to worship, but also to be continuing to pray with us for the families that you would have in your life. And the, I know I've got family members in my life that don't know the Lord. And so as we're worshiping with the team today, we're going to continue praying over the role that we've adopted. Feel free to move around the sanctuary and you at home just engage your faith with, with us for family members that you have that are not um, in the kingdom of God yet. So we're going to do that as we worship the Lord today. And so that's why we've distanced the rows. We also want to thank our usher and greeter teams um, for having your masks on. We know we're just positioning ourselves to receive the lost and we're positioning ourselves to receive the unchurched. And so we really want to cater to people that would feel comfortable coming in um, into a service like this. So amen. Amen. The reason why we do what we do, everything from the space of the chairs being six feet apart to praying over our chairs to those who are volunteering wearing masks from all the whole spectrum is to remove obstacles for people to come that are living a life that um, they're still feeling uncertain. We want to remove every obstacle for people to come and experience the life, love, and power of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what we do what we do. It's not a political statement. As you guys will learn, learn who we are, we are not going to ever do anything here. That's a political statement. Everything is a Jesus statement. Everything that we do, our whole life, we lead with love. And so when I do something, the decisions that I make, just like when God makes a decision, he leads with love, I'm going to do the same thing. And so today, if you already haven't uh, spread out to the row that you adopted, or even if you weren't here last week and don't, haven't adopted a row, there's plenty of rows for you guys to adopt. And so we're going to spend part of our service again today praying over the empty chairs, praying over people's life that yet have yet to come experience Jesus. Amen? So that's going to be something that we do. But I want to say again, thank you guys so much. And let's open up in, 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 a, in a word for prayer. Let's talk to our Father together. And then we're going to worship God unfettered together as a church. Amen? So Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can come today into this place and we can experience your life. We can have an encounter with Jesus the one who comes and meets with us. We know that when we worship you, you're there in our midst. We know that as we worship you, you're here, you're here meeting us. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can come worship you in this place. We know that we can worship you where we are in our homes, un uh, 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 unashamed even if we're in our pajamas or haven't even washed our hair yet because we're alone and we can sing to Jesus without anybody judging us. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, Father, I pray for an environment here that we can do the same that we wouldn't be worried about what the person on our, uh, behind us or in front of us is thinking, but that we worship you, we'll lay everything aside and we'll worship you in this moment today. I pray, God, that we would hear and we would receive from you today. That if we're home or if we're here in person, I pray, God, today would be the day. Today would be a life-changing moment. Today we would hear a word from God. And it would, we would never be the same again. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. 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 All right, here we go. You guys ready? Yes. Get over. Yeah. You are good and your mercy 
separation. Your name is more powerful than any sin. Your name is more powerful than addiction. It's the name of Jesus. Every name will bow. Every knee will bow. So Lord, we thank you for the name of Jesus. We thank you that Jesus came and he conquered death. He conquered the grave. He conquered sin for me. Lord, and in this moment we want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you have the name above every name. Thank you that at your name, all heaven and earth is shaken. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. That you have no rival. You have no rival. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Just worship him for a moment more. You have. No rival, Jesus. You have no equal, Jesus. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all. today if you're sitting in your home or are sitting in these chairs if you have a need in this moment I want you to know that you can call on the name of Jesus that if you have a need in your body physical emotional spiritual that Jesus wants to meet you where you are in the location that you are and so in this moment you can simply raise your hand and say Jesus I need you. And Jesus, I thank you that you come and you meet us in this moment. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, you are faithful. Well, again, thank you guys so much for coming today. Did you come expecting something? Did you come expecting to receive from Jesus today? Because if you haven't, didn't come that way, I'm telling you, get your expectations up. Because today, in this moment, Jesus wants to meet you. Jesus wants to meet you right here 
in this moment. And I believe today, if you'll let him, Jesus will answer the prayers that you have been praying, the needs that you have been having and you've been praying for. Jesus wants to meet that innermost need today. Do you believe that today? Amen. Amen. I want you guys to know that I am so grateful that you are here, that you're watching online, and today is going to be a good day. Amen. Amen. Before you, turn, before you take your seats, turn around and air five at least three people. Air five them. Say, I am thankful for you. And then turn to, the, uh, turn to your adopted row and air five all the people that are going to be showing up in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Amen. Amen. Man, God is good. Thank you so much, worship team, for all you do for ushering in the presence of God. I love it when we can worship together. Because when we worship together, Jesus is in our midst. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, today we're going to be talking uh, about something that we started last week. Last week we started a two-part series about faith. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. I know. And today we're going to be finishing up that series. Today we're going to be talking about something um, that I believe is a crisis in the church. I believe that it's something that we all have to battle against. I believe that it's something um, that we each need to realize about ourselves and about other believers and people that even haven't come into the knowledge of Jesus yet. And it's something I want to call mental assent. Uh, today we're, uh, in today's uncertainty, we must hold fast to our beliefs in God. Not just our beliefs about God, but our beliefs about who God says he is. And our beliefs in our relationship with God. Especially in today's world. Especially in, where, uh, in, in the uncertainty that, that we're experiencing all across this world. Not just here in Arizona, not just here in the United States, but all across this world. Yesterday, my wife and I had a, a, a unique opportunity uh, to go down to Tempe, and I wanted to show her where, when I was in Bible, uh, Bible school here, um, we used to go down on Saturdays and minister to people that would have, you know, the drum circles down in, uh, what's that, 6th Street down in Tempe. And uh, while we were down there, I found a place called Phoenicia Cafe. If you're down in Tempe, go see Muhammad. Muhammad makes some serious shawarma. I'm just saying it was incredible shawarma. Shawarma, sorry, I apologize. Uh, and, and we were able to talk with him yesterday about uh, how his mother in, in Tunisia was having some issues and he couldn't even fly out. Tunisia was forcing everybody to spend 14 days at their own cost in hotels before they could even do anything. And they would go straight from the, hotel, uh, from the airport to a hotel. There's uncertainty in our world. And people have serious, legitimate needs right now. And this isn't, and, and I'm not talking about, um, it doesn't matter what the cause is. It, it doesn't matter what your belief about what's going on. People have needs. Especially in today's society, you and I need to hold fast our confession of faith. Amen. Today, before I even begin, I want to encourage you, though, that if you're watching online or if you're sitting here, I want to encourage you that if you're feeling the feeling of being stuck or if you're feeling that you need to accept where you are in life because it's, well, I'm at this age in my life, I'm at this stage of my life, or I'm at this moment in my life, and that means that I just need to, I just need to resolve myself to accept where I am. And, and the feeling of being stuck, if you're feeling this, is the new normal for you. Maybe you've been feeling that things will never get better, that you're at the lowest low, and you're like, things just can't even get worse. That means they can't even get better for me. I'm stuck in my addiction. I'm stuck in my, you know, in my problems. I'm stuck in my, my situation. 
and, and there's nothing that I can do about it. This is my new normal. I want you to hear this. Trust God. Even if you don't know how, even if you don't know when, even if you don't understand the, what, how God could even bring it about, trust in God. Christianity is about our faith in an unseen entity who is God. God who is unseen is seen by our faith and everything that we do, regardless if we understand the situation, regardless if we see uh, what we want to see in life, regardless of where we are, we need to trust God more than we ever have before. Ever before. Even if the world is in chaos and everything looks bleak around us, we need to shift our perspective. Did you hear that? Shift our perspective off of the situation and on the one who can change it. Amen? Because when we take our focus off of the problem and onto him that is the answer to that problem, we'll find that he was just waiting for us to trust him in the first place. Because we will read later, as we did last week, that it is impossible to please God without what? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So he is just waiting for us to trust in him, to believe in him. Amen? And when we shift our, our focus off of the situation, all of the chaos that, that is around us, all of the, the turmoil that might be in our life, and we shift our focus off of the problem down here, our temporal situation, and we focus it and we shift our focus onto Him, we'll see that in that moment that He's been, uh, ch uh, he's been behind the scenes changing it the entire time. That even the surface might look, might look like giant waves. But underneath the surface, God has been working on our behalf to change around the situation in our life. That it doesn't matter what's going on around us in our life, in our sphere of influence, that things can't get better. Oh, they all, absolutely, they actually can. God wants to do greater and greater things in us. But I want you to know God is working on your behalf, trust him. Trust him. I feel that a, a lot of times in my life, um, I believe something. And, and I'm going to tie this in right now. That today we're going to be talking about, we're continuing faith. But I, wanna, I want you to, you can write down on your page if you're taking notes or if you're following along. Today I want to talk about faith, hope, and not love. Faith, hope, and mental ascent. Faith, hope, and mental ascent. Because these three topics all coincide within what is important for us today. And I, because I feel that a lot of times in my life, I've had a head knowledge or I've believed something is true, but not necessarily had faith for it. And what do you mean by that? See, last week I, I, I talked about how when I was younger and I went on missions trips and I had an encounter with Jesus when I was in my teenage years and, and, and I had an experience with Jesus. But something growing up, I used, to have, I used to have a belief. I don't believe it was ever taught to me, but I caught it in the circles that I ran in. And going on missions trips actually solidified it instead of changed my perspective, which was very unique. Because when I was on missions trips, when I would go all over the world and I would experience missions trips, people would have life change, drastic life change. I remember praying for a man with AIDS that, la that I found out later was healed in that moment from AIDS. I remember, I remember pe uh, people who, who were paralyzed and, and getting up. I remember praying for people with, uh, with all kinds of diseases in their bodies and seeing the miraculous in that moment. And I believed in the healing power of God because I saw it. I believed that concept was true because I saw it overseas. But when I came home, I never saw it here. And so I came up with a belief in my own life because I believed that God healed people because I saw it. But I came up with my own type of faith in it. I believed that he would either hear, uh, heal them here, there, or in the air. You ever heard that? 
One day you'll be healed. Even if it's not today, it might be tomorrow. And if it's not tomorrow, eventually when you die, you'll be healed. <laughs> and I honestly believed that. And, and I believed a concept, but last week we talked about relational faith versus religious faith. And I had a religious faith about, about the goodness of God. I had a, good, a, a religious faith about the power of God. I believed uh, God could heal. I didn't necessarily believe that he would heal. And there is a huge difference between believing that he can and believing that he will versus believing that he already has. Today I want to talk to you about the phenomenon that I mentioned earlier, mental ascent. I'm finding Christians that say something is true, but they don't walk in it just like I did. I hear people say all the time that God is good, yet they blame him when something bad happens. Or they say this, it must have been his will. And they, they, we, we say it in churches all across the world. God is good all the time. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Right? See, I, don't, I couldn't even say it right because I don't even say it anymore. It became such a religious liturgy to me. I was like, I'm not saying that phrase again. I believed it, but I was tired of saying it. Because everybody would say it, and I would say it, but yet... When something would occur in my life that was negative or bad, I would say it must have been God's will. Well, we don't know the plan of God for our lives. And don't get me wrong. I believe that God is on his throne. God is on his throne. Absolutely. But does God want evil for you? Does God want bad things? Does God hold a stick in his hand trying to teach you a lesson? No. I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. Anywhere in the New Testament. I just don't. I just don't. See, there's a difference between believing something by having a mental assent towards something and actually having relational faith about something. Relationship with God is so much different than just having a religious faith towards God. Or about God. Do you see what I'm saying? So let me ask you this question. Who in here believes that God can heal? I mean, we, we, we see it all through scripture. We see it all through even today. I, I, I've seen miraculous healings. I absolutely believe that God can heal. Can. I've seen the, uh, I've seen the paralyzed get out of their wheelchairs. I've seen, I've seen arms grow out where there was no arm. I've seen it. Nobody could take that belief away because I've experienced it with my own eyes. Yeah, nobody can take that away. Uh, um, I don't know who was the original author of this quote, but Donnie Moore, the man who was instrumental in, in leading me to the Lord or, or, or helping me see that I needed a relationship with the Lord, um, who's now in heaven, um, once said this. and He said, the man... W- with an argument is subject to the man with an experience. My experience far supersedes your argument towards me. You cannot dissuade me because of my experience of seeing the truth. You can't. So let me ask you this. How about who believes in here that God can provide all our needs? I believe he can. But what happens if I were to ask you if you believe that God will do that for you? Right? Right? So let me ask and get a little bit more nosy. Who, who in here sees that happening in their life? Amen. Amen. There is a, a big thing that I want to help people in. If you're watching or if you're sitting here, I want to help you go from having mental assent to having a relational faith in God. I want to see you go from when you pray a prayer, you're no longer throwing it up into the air to have it come crashing down like a dud. But I want you to go from that to seeing the fruits be produced in your life. Because John chapter 15 says that by these fruits, my Father is glorified, Jesus said. I want to to see you go from lack 
to plenty. I want to see you go from dry to soaking wet. I want to see you go from depressed to over full of joy. Amen. Amen. That is my heart. So he, I hear this all the time when I ask these types of questions, though. Well, I sure hope so, Pastor. I sure hope so. I know God can do these things, and I sure hope he'll do it for me. But not you. Not you. I trust that. I know that at Desert Valley Church, nobody has ever said that before. But I know in my own life, I personally have. <laughs> See, I want to teach us today the difference between that statement and a statement in faith. Because I want you to know that hoping for something isn't having faith for something. Amen? So I want to teach you. The first point that I want you to see is the difference between faith and hope. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now it says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance. Substance of things hoped for. So before we explore the difference between these two subjects, faith and hope, we first need to understand what faith is. And first let me tell you that there is a difference between, like I said last week, Bible faith or relational faith and religious faith or human faith. Everyone has faith. You all activated your faith today when you came in and sat in that chair. I have faith that when I take a step onto this step, it's going to hold my weight. You had faith when you came in here and took a seat in that chair. And it, you knew it was going to hold your weight. You had human faith for something. The Bible even says that God has given us each a measure of faith. So we can't say we can't have faith for something. We can, all have a measure of faith. God gave that gift to us. Every human being was born with the ability to have faith. It, we, we were also born with the ability to grow in that faith. And today we're going to look at how to grow in that faith. But first, let's see. Faith is the substance. We need to know what faith is. The difference between natural and Bible faith is that Bible faith, known as relational faith, is believing with your heart, not with your head. With my head... I understand things. With my natural reasoning, I know this stage is going to hold me because, well, I trust. I shouldn't say I know. I trust that the builders of the stage put the studs at the appropriate distance. Hopefully, if they really wanted to make this stage really heavy and, 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 and just airtight, six inches apart. It's not six inches apart. Who built the stage? Does anybody know? It's probably not six inches. The studs are not six inches apart. They're probably eight to 16 or eight to whatever. And so I trust, because I've been walking on this, that the builders of this built to code. And that when I walk on it, I'm not going to fall through between the studs. And they used a certain amount of thickness of a plywood to build it on top, so it's, it's, it's dense enough that I'm not going to just break through this board while I'm walking. That's my natural faith. That is natural faith. There is a vast dis difference between believing with your heart in just believing what your physical senses may tell you. My physical senses, that's sturdy. Bible faith is laying hold of the unseen realm of hope. I hope, honestly, because I wasn't here to see this stage built, I hope that this stage will hold me. I haven't walked on the whole stage, and I'm hoping that the builders built it to code all the way through. I hope that. There is an extreme difference between hope, um, laying a hold of the unseen realm of hope, and bringing it into the realm of reality. Bible faith grows out of the Word of God. If you and I want to grow in faith, it comes out of the Word of God. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what the Bible says, because what does the Bible say about how faith comes? It comes by hearing and hearing and hearing, 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 and hearing the word of God. We can't just hear something twice. 
I remember when I was learning my ABCs, I couldn't hear it just twice and, and know A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We sing that constantly in preschool, every day in preschool and kindergarten. Every day we're singing that song over and over and over. And the repetition causes the, the, the understanding or the faith to be produced. It's the same with faith. In the Bible, in God, we need to know what he says about himself over and we need to hear it over and over and over again. See, you hope for your finances to pay your bills. And faith is the action that gives you the assurance that you'll have the money when you need it because faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is an action, by the way. Belief, I'm believing in something, is an action. Belief is an actionable thing. That is what faith is. So what is faith? It's simply what you believe. It's not some lofty formula on how to receive something. It's, who's ever, um, when I was in a certain company when I first got married, we were forced in, in the marketing uh, department to watch The Secret. Who's ever, who's ever seen The Secret? Secret, 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 secret. That's the opening intro for the whole marketing sales thing. Anybody seen it? <clears throat> and if you just believe hard enough that a bike will miraculously appear in your driveway, if you believe long enough and hard enough, that bike will miraculously appear in your driveway. That is one of the examples that this, the marketing campaign gives. I'm, I'm dead serious. <clears throat> Faith is not a secret. <laughs> Faith is not a formula. Thank the Lord. It's not some mystical concept that if you can just believe hard enough or long enough that you'll receive whatever it is that you are believing for. It's not what it is <laughs> at all, thank the Lord. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is substance. Faith is substance for what we hope for. Faith is proving God's word by acting on what it says. I believe or I should say, I hope that the stage holds me. My belief is proven by walking on it. I believe it, and I'm bringing my action into play by walking on it. And so my hope is being proven out by my faith. Faith needs to be acted on. Otherwise, it says in James that faith is dead, and we'll get into that later. We need to stop saying, well, I hope God will answer my prayer, or one day God will answer my prayer. And if all we're doing is hoping, we won't receive an answer to our prayers. Faith is what moves God on our behalf, not hope. I have hope in heaven. I have hope in my eternal rest. Dear Jesus, thank you for rest one day. Thank you for the mountains that I'm going to get to climb and not fall down off of them and be worried that I'll die. I can hang on those things. Like, I am so excited about heaven. You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, uh, but it, <laughs> that's my hope, my eternal hope, that I get to get there and I get to see my Savior face to face. That's my hope. My hope, my faith in that belief or in that hope is actionably leading me to walk that out every day. I can't just hope for something and then just walk away and not do anything about it. There's no faith in that. My faith has action, amen? So what is hope set? Let me tell you what hope says versus what faith says. Hope says, I will have my prayers answered sometime. Faith says, my prayer has been answered. <laughs> hope says, well, I really hope that God hears my prayer today. Faith says, God is hearkening to my prayer. <laughs> hope says, well, one day. Faith says, today. Amen? Ta faith takes what you're wanting to do. Faith takes what you're hoping for and brings it into what you're doing now. It's relational. It's an everyday thing. You can't just have relationship once in a blue moon. You have to have it every day. We can believe these things because we know what the Bible says. Did you hear that? 
You guys will hear me say it a lot. I'm a man who... Read your Bible. Read it. Make your... What, what I call a word life. Make yourself a disciplined habit of having a word life. Every day. And I mean every day. I told you guys last week that how my son and I have a, a, an inside joke that, Dad, you're turning into the Hulk. In other words, read your stinking Bible, Dad. <laughs> read your Bible. <laughs> you're grumpy. <laughs> Go read your Bible. It's the only way that he's allowed to say something like that without it being disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time. And I, I'll come up to him and say, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm totally hulking out and I'm sorry. And I have to apologize to my kids all the time because I, I hulk out on them if I'm not in the Word. That's why I have to have a word life. That's why I'm in it every day. It's every day I have a word life because it's solidifying my trust, my relationship with God. Read it every day. I don't know if I've told you this before. I mean, this is my Bible. It's, it's ripped. It's frayed. I was thinking of recovering it recently, and I don't want to. I honestly don't want to. I want to leave this one and probably just get a new one. Because this one smells, looks, tastes. I know where everything, uh, yeah, Brother Don and I were talking the other day. I know, I can just, even if I don't know the verse, I know what to look for, what it looks like, the shape of those verses, because I've been reading these things for so long. This is my first thing that I ever believed God for, was this Bible. When I was at Rama and I learned about what I'm teaching you, I had this big old thick, uh, Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible that I got for graduating high school early. You know, my dad bought it, and it was literally like that wide. Okay, I'm slightly exaggerating. And it weighed at least 80 pounds. Again, the exaggeration. And I had a, I had a teacher at Rama my first year. His name was uh, Marvin Yoder. I absolutely love Marvin Yoder. Um, and he would have us raise our, our book up in the air like John Osteen. And John Osteen, I believe Joel Osteen does it as, as well. And he would have us raise our Bible up and, and declare, this is my Bible. I am what the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I am. I do what the Bible says. You know, and we're sitting there. And, and Reverend Marvin, he, he loved to add every single class something to that phrase. And so this muscle grouping here was just massive because I was holding up this 500-pound Bible and I, I mean, I was just shredded. I mean, okay. And I got tired of, of holding this up. And in fact, there, my neighbor, we would do a joke and he'd put his hand, he'd put his Bible on my, you know, arm on my shoulder and I'd put my arm on his shoulder. And we would do that and, and because it was so tiring and so long. Um, and so I'm like, you know what? This faith stuff better work. Let's find out if it works. I was having hope. <laughs> I hope faith works. Let's find out what it does. And so I'm like, Lord... Lord, I need a new Bible. I want a new Bible. Uh, and I'd heard about somebody's story once of, uh, uh, of their faith. So I'm like, you know what? God wants specifics. I, I want a new Bible, Lord, with a black leather cover with my name in gold on it. And I want it to be thin line. And I want it to be able to fit right here and good to, to bend and shake at people and hit people over the head with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being sarcastic whatsoever. It's my prayer. Don't judge me for my prayer. It's my prayer. It's not your prayer. <laughs> and I prayed this prayer. And a week to the day, somebody came up to me. And, you know, I prayed it, and I prayed it for that week. And somebody comes up to me, and they hand me a, 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 book, a box that was a thin box with this Bible in it. And she said to me, uh, in class last week, the Lord told me to buy you this Bible. And, she, and he told me to buy you a black leather Bible with gold print and New King James thin line. And I went to the store that same day and I ordered it and they were out of stock and it took them this long to get it. And this is your, would, is this okay? Would you like this? And I looked at her and my jaw like hung down here. And, and I'm like, what just happened? See, God wanted to prove to me something. And I want to encourage you in this. That if you've been hoping for something, God can meet you where you're at. And you haven't discovered something about God. The depths of his love. The depths of his desire to be with you and meet with you. And you've been struggling in just your hope. And you've been hoping for something. That God's grace is there for you. 
His unmerited favor that you don't deserve is there to meet your need where you are. Where you are. At the stage of life that I was, I was wanting to prove something. I, I wanted, I was testing God. I was. I was. And it was unscriptural. And it was unbiblical. It really was. We don't test God. The only time it says to test God is in our tithe. God says, the only way to test me is test me with your tithe and watch what I'll do. I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't even contain. It's the only time in scripture we see that we can test God. The only time. But yet, I was testing him. God's not scared by your tests. God's not scared of your doubts. God's not scared of your hope. But he wants to move you beyond hope into relational faith. He wants to move you from the realm of what you see and hope for or what you don't see and what you hope for into the realm of relational faith where you see and act every day on what your relationship is telling you. God wants to talk to you every day. God wants to talk to you every day, amen? So if you're wanting an answer to a prayer that you've had concerning a certain thing and you aren't seeing an answer, then realize it isn't God withholding it from you. The problem is found on our end. I remember I was praying for something years ago and my wife had told me previously, you know, I love, I, I love bread. I love gluten. I love yeast. I love fluffy, gooey, f just juicy loaves of bread right out of the oven. I love it. And I, every time that we would go out, I would eat bread. For lunches, I would make sandwiches. I love sandwiches. I love my favorite thing that you'll learn about me is I love cinnamon rolls. Not just any cinnamon roll. Gooey, just, just not dry. Do not give me a dry cinnamon roll. I'll say, oh, bless your little heart. It hits the spot, and I named my garbage can the spot. <laughs> I love gooey, wet, moist cinnamon rolls. That the center is just creamy and there's just a, like, just a shell of, of, of soft frosting over it. And I eat it. I can cut it with a fork. And I love those. Yeah, sorry, I really got into, into depth about bread and cinnamon rolls. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but in my relationship, I, I believe, you know, we, had first, we, we, we had just gotten married. And, and I had been praying because I, I had been getting heartburn, something fierce, for a, for a while at this point. And I'm just like, Lord, like I know that you don't want me to have heartburn. So what am I doing? And I learned that from one of my teachers of Christ the Healer at Ramah. His name was Mike Gilbert. And he always said that if you're not receiving something from God, it's not his fault. It's your fault. Do something about it. Find out what it is that he told you to do. Go do it. Go back to the last thing he told you and just simply do it. And so I remember that, and I'm like, oh, okay, what's the last thing that you told me to do? He's like, I spoke to you through your wife. And I said, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> and what was it that she told me? Stop eating bread. <laughs> so, huh? Too simple. Too simple. I'm like, that's not what's causing my heartburn. I stopped eating bread, and immediately I stopped having heartburn. <laughs> well, over the years, I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> And so because of my arrogance and my stupidity for not listening to my wife, men who are married and guys who are going to be married one day, listen to your wives. They know more than you. <laughs> and, and so I, I discovered something uh, about myself when I moved to Texas that I gained all 20 pounds. And it's my Texas quake. And I didn't want to look that way anymore. And so I'm like, man, Lord, our, you know, first thing that I do, I'm going to jump on a diet. And it just so happened to be keto. And on keto, you don't eat bread. <laughs> and I remembered, oh yeah, that's what my wife told me to do. Ah, so I did it, and I haven't had heartburn since day two of being on keto. But the Lord reminded me of something of that I needed to do earlier. Relational faith. Relational 
faith. Mental assent is I knew that I shouldn't be eating so much bread. I knew bread, for whatever reason, it did not uh, uh, agree with my indigestion or my digestive tract, or whatever it is, my protein markers in my body, if you want to get detailed, it was not agreeing with it, and my body was rejecting it in the form of heartburn. And so I knew that from years ago because the Lord reminded me of my, what my wife said. So when the Lord said, reminded me of what she said, it was basically like the Lord was speaking through her. It's amazing. And my mental ascent was I knew that, but I wasn't walking in it. I had no action towards it. John Wesley said it this way. He's the founder of the Methodist movement, and he said this. The devil has given the church a substitute for faith. That looks and sounds so much like faith, many people can't tell the difference. And the substitute is called mental assent. John Wesley said that. I don't even know how many years ago that was. An example of this is when many people see what God's word says and they agree mentally that God's word is true. But they're just agreeing with their minds. Mental agreement with the word is not faith. It's relational faith or a heart faith that receives from God. Romans 10.10, 10, if you turn with me in the New King James, it says this. For with the heart one believes. For with the heart one believes. This is, what, this is what Jesus was talking about in the text that we've been looking at for the last two weeks. Mark 11.23, right? It says, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. <laughs> Relational faith comes from your heart. That's why when we say we love you, it's like, what's, does that look like a heart? Okay, there we go. It's, we say we love you, and we show hearts and heart emojis. It's with our heart where that affection lies. It's heart, with our heart where that relationship lies. He does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done. He'll have whatever he says. Notice Jesus never said, do not doubt with your mind. Earlier I told you this, God's not scared of your doubt. God's not scared of your doubt. God doesn't even mind it. He doesn't. He's not scared of it. If you have doubt, go to him. If it's stuck up here and you're just having a hard time conceptualizing something, go to him. It's okay. Peter learned. He had doubt. At first he trusted on, with Jesus and he's like, Jesus, what do you, if it's you, call me out onto this ocean and I'll come to you. And Jesus said, come. And so he got out. He trusted Jesus. But then he saw with his senses the, the tossing of the sea. He saw his circumstances and he doubted. If God was scared of our doubt or didn't want to meet us in our doubt, the next, ver the next situation in that verse would never have happened. What did, when Peter started sinking, he cried out, Lord, save me. He was still doubting because he was sinking. In that moment, Jesus, it says, immediately reached out and grabbed him. In our doubt, Jesus can still show up. But we got to move on from there. You better believe Peter learned real fast that he could trust Jesus. Because what happened? They walked back together. Jesus and Peter walked together. Jesus didn't carry Peter. Peter walked on water again. Peter, he got his doubt under control because he cried out to Jesus. Jesus helped him in his unbelief. Jesus helps us in our unbelief. Belief. So now, how do you know if you're having mental assent or relational faith? How do we know that? See, if we've been praying and we haven't been seeing answers, and you're questioning why you aren't receiving, even when you're quoting scripture, <laughs> you're in mental assent. Did you hear me? If you're wondering why you're not receiving your answer, and you're stuck, and you're in that repetition of praying and wondering why, and wondering why, you're in mental assent. See, what faith does in those moments when you're not seeing the, the answer to your prayer, it has an action. Lord, what is it you would have me do? What's going on? Because I know there's, there's something and it's not you that's hindering what's going on, my need from being met. What do I need 
to do. And last week I told you when Mary was at, Mary and Jesus were at the wedding and she turned to the workers at the, at the wedding and said, whatever it is that Jesus says to do, do it. We in our faith, in our relational faith, need to come, up to, uh, come to the realization that when Jesus tells us to do something, we need to do it. Amen? Amen. Hmm. So this is what I want to close with. Faith is an action. Faith is an action. Faith is not just a concept. It's not a formula. It's not mental assent. It's not a religious thing. It's an action. James chapter 2, verse 26, the last half of that verse, says this. So faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Our faith cannot be just in word. If we please God by our faith, then we can see that our faith is actionable. If we see that we can play, please God by our faith, then that means that faith is something that we do, not just something we believe or something that we say. It's actionable. Faith always has an action point. Always. Always. It has works attached to it. And those are what produce the results. If we are saying that God provides all our needs and are quoting scriptures about provision, yet we won't go out and get a job, if we won't go out and get a, a means of making money, this is mental assent. This is religious faith. But when we put ourselves out there and diligently work to find a method of making money, that's something that we are doing in faith. It's our faith producing, producing actions. Our faith produces actions. If it is word alone, we can say this, and you can read the whole chapter of James chapter 2, and it says, you say you have faith, and I'll show you my faith by my works. We'll see who can compare then. You say you have mental assent, I'll show you results. I don't even have to say anything. When Jesus says to do something, I don't need to say anything. I don't even need to speak my faith. I'm going to walk my faith. Sometimes our actions and our life speak louder than our words. And this is coming from a rhema guy, the spoken word guy. Our faith that has action points need to be louder than what we're saying. They do. They absolutely have to be louder than our words. Our words and our actions have to line up. And it needs to, our actions need to be louder, though. God blesses what you're putting your actions to. So here's my challenge. How will you put your actions to your beliefs this week? What have you been believing God for? What have you been seeking his face about? What have you been questioning him about? What is it that you may not even have been needing or uh, uh, asking him for, but you have a need of? Maybe you feel that he doesn't, you're not worthy of him answering your prayers, so you haven't even gone to him. What is it that you is in the deepest part of you that you need from God today? I told you at the beginning of service that God wants to meet you today. And what is it that you need in your living room? in your bedrooms, in your workplace, in this church building? What is it that you need from God today? Don't just know that or believe that he can do it. Believe that he wants to do it and that he will do it. Jesus once asked the leper, and he said, what, what, what do you want from me? Lord, that you, I believe that you can heal me. Will you heal me? And Jesus turned to him and he said, oh yeah, yes I will. Jesus wanted him to know that not only can he, but he will. What is it that you need? What is it that you need? What is the deepest part of you been crying out on your bed at night when nobody can hear you? What is it that you wait until you're in the shower so nobody can see your tears to cry out to God? What is it that you need when you go out to the garage or your man cave and, or out to your secret place and you've been crying out year after year, day after day, that you need most? What is it? I want you to know that in that moment, 
God wants to meet you in this moment. In this moment. In this moment. God wants to meet you. God wants to meet you. God wants to meet you. Father, so we just come to you today. We come to you, not just with our, our mental state, not just with our uh, belief that you can do it, not just our belief that you may do it one day, but we believe that you want to do it and you will do it because you've already done it. Lord, we know that because of what you did when you were here on earth, you conquered all things. Your name became the name above all names. And that in our situations, sometimes we don't feel worthy enough to receive from you. Sometimes we feel just tired. Tired of having to believe something over and over and over again. Over and over and seeing results sometimes and seeing results or the lack of results in other times. Sometimes we just get tired. And in our fatigue of having to believe you, in our fatigue of having to day by day just struggle. God, sometimes we, we, we stop trusting in you. I pray, God, today, just as Peter cried out, Lord, save me, immediately you stretched out your hand and you rescued him. Today, God, if we're standing in faith for something and we're already having action points to our faith or we're just hoping right now, I pray, God, whatever the situation we find ourselves in, that you would meet us right now that your spirit that you gave you said you wouldn't leave us alone and you sent your spirit to live in us to guide us it, say, it says that the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead in, in Romans chapter 8 verse 11 will give life to our mortal flesh will give life to us and I pray God today right now we would receive from your spirit your life your life is the answer that we need. In Jesus' name, wherever we are, all across this place, on, in people's homes, across this globe, I pray, God, that in this moment while they're hearing, that they would receive from you. They'd say, what is it, Lord, that you would have me do? I'm going to do it. And in this moment, you would meet that need in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And if you have a need in your body, you can simply slip your hand up right now. And here's what you can do. Know that Jesus is here. And whatever situation you find yourself in, you, by raising your hand, by raising your, your mind and your heart towards him, are receiving that answer. Are receiving the, the, the miracle. You're receiving right now from Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, if you're watching online, or even if you're here, you're here, and you've never decided to have relationship with Jesus, and you might be in your living room, and you might be alone, you might be with your family, you might be in a group of people watching this, but right now I want you to know that you can have a relationship with Jesus. Right now. And all you have to do is say yes to him. Say yes to him. Lord, be my God. Be my Savior. Now and forevermore. And that's all you have to say. There's no formula to it. You just have to receive relationship with him. He'll come into your life. Forgive everything that you've ever done. Cleanse you, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. And he'll make you a new creation. A child of God who will spend forever more with him. And if you want to receive him, all you have to do is say, Lord, save me. Lord, I want you right now in Jesus' name. Father, we just receive as well the, the needs that we have. We receive from you. We receive your goodness today in Jesus' name. Lord, and we thank you that all across this auditorium, in people's homes, across this globe, that you're meeting the needs of people because it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads people to you. And you're, you're that good. You're that good. And so we thank you, Lord, in this moment 
for all that you've done. All that you've done. We receive you now, today, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 So it's like really little. I didn't see a little button down there. The quality of our life will always be a result of our response to the word. The word that we hear spoken, the word that we hear God speak on the inside of us, the quality of our life. You know, you know John 10:10 10, 10, that God came to give us life and life abundantly, and so many people they're not receiving the abundant life of God. They're not receiving the overflow of all that God has. Well, the quality of our life will always be our response. It's a result of our response to the Word of God. What we hear, taking it, receiving it, and say, I'm going to act upon that, is relational faith. So I'm going to talk just a minute about giving. One of my favorite things to teach, especially young people, I know y'all are seasoned givers, um, we love to give. So anytime I get to share on um, tithes and offerings, you're going to probably hear a story from me or an analogy from me or something because I love to teach on giving. And I know we have seasoned givers here, but if you online have never participated in giving, I'm going to tell you why. We give and we love to give. When I came into my Christian faith, you know, and I started learning about the things of God and how to allow God access into my life to start seeing his abundant life move in different arenas of my life, I decided I should go to the Word and I should find out his will and how he operates. So my favorite chapter in the whole Bible, I love absolutely every scripture in Romans 8. And you heard Josh quote my favorite scripture, actually, verse 11. But verse 32, and I'm going to give you the Christina paraphrase because I'm really used to teaching a lot of times young people, youth, not even in church, just anywhere I have a chance to teach people on how to allow God in your economy. And I use the word economy because, you know, it's our, like, sphere of influence, what we have to, what our abilities are to make money and our ability to give and receive and just to flow. It's like our economy. So God wants access to be a blessing in your life, but he needs faith. So in Romans 8, verse 32, my paraphrased version says that God gave us his best when he gave us his son. He won't withhold anything else from us. So if God demonstrated what giving looks like by giving his best, I can say, I see what my father does, therefore I'm going to do it. I hear what my father says, therefore I'm going to repeat it. So in my life, I want you to hold up ten fingers. Now, what would be your finger number one? Usually from the direction that you read. This, let's say this is finger number one. We've got ten fingers, okay? All of us here know what a tithe is, but some of you may be watching online, you've never really been taught what a tithe is. A tithe is a first tenth, so that would be finger number one. A tithe is not my last tenth. Let's just divide it into ten, right? It's my best to God. And the reason that God deemed the tithe a blessing is because he saw this man named Abraham radically give to him a tenth. And he, he saw such radical faith and demonstration, God said, there will always be a blessing on your first tenth. But like we teach our kids, there's a blessing on every part of your giving. So there's a specific blessing on your first tenth. But did you know there's a blessing on top of anything else I choose to give God? And maybe you're not at a tenth. Maybe you're new to giving. You're like, you know what, Lord, I, I have an extra like $5 in my back pocket. Or, you know, I want to stretch myself and I want to do something based on what I heard. And I'm going to give, you know, 1%. There's a blessing on 1%. Trust me. There's a blessing on 1%. There's a blessing on my last percent. But there will always be a unique and special blessing on the 10th. And Josh mentioned at the beginning, it's the floodgates of heaven. And as the Lord teaches and instructs us by his spirit that we can steward that, we don't need to squander. A lot of people are seeing the floodgates of heaven open in their life, but they're seeing it actually trickle out, and they're seeing it go all kind of places that's not actually benefiting them. But did you know that God also not only gave us his best, but he didn't withhold anything else from us? That when he gave us Jesus, he also said everything else comes with him. Freedom, healing, peace of mind. The fact that now the spirit of God lives on the inside of me to direct me in my everyday life. So therefore, if I see my father do that, I'm going to also do that. So not only am I going to just say, you know, in the circles of givers, sometimes we can like tip God our 10%. 
We could just be like, God, I'm so used to giving. I'm just going to scratch it off the top and be done with it and go about my whole week spending this, 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 and not including you in it. But since I saw God give his best and I saw him not withhold anything else, I'm going to say, you know what, Lord, help me with this area. Help me in this. How, how can I be a giver in this area? How can I give off my food budget? my car budget? How can I be a blessing with my home? When I'm clothing my kids, help me to also take care of the, the kid that we sponsored on the other side of the world. How can I allow you access into my economy and all these other areas of my life? That's where you start seeing the blessing of God really flow and flood. When we don't withhold all those other areas from God. You know, I recently came, I have all, I have my budget, you know, and I try to be a giver in all these areas. And I was down to my last, like, $5 of coffee money. And I'm really good. I have my budget. I have my, you know, I pay my bills on time. And I have my savings and all these other areas. And I, my kids are clothed, you know, and we're paying all these, our phone bills. Everything's paid way ahead of time. And I'm, I kind of like to stay within my lane. And I came down my, to my last $5. And it was like the day I was going to get paid or something. And I have money, but I like to stay within my budget. And I felt the Lord challenge me to give this money to one of, one of my kids' friends needed something. And they were with me that day. And I was like, it was so easy for me to give you my best tenth and then other areas that I sew in and I give in. And when it came down to my last $5, I was having such a hard time. I was having an attitude in my heart. And the Lord was, I was like, why is this $5 so hard, Lord? It was because it was my all. And God told me, wait till you see what's on the other side of your all. I had such an easy time giving off the top, giving God my best, but what he wanted was my heart. He said, if I didn't withhold anything else from you when I gave you Jesus, I want your all. It doesn't mean all my money, but it means all in my heart in every one of those areas and those avenues of income and resources and time and energy that I have. He wants me to consult him every day with that. So now not only do I love giving, I've always loved giving to the church since I was young and I, was, I saw just like, wow, yeah, God will obviously he takes care of me when I give. But in these other areas that were sometimes a challenge, when I had to drive out of my way to do something for somebody, just do it as unto the Lord in that area. And I've always driven a good car. It's always been taken care of and I've never been left destitute on the side of the road. You know, when I give off my food budget, which is like, next, it's like the next biggest bill next to my house because we really like good food and we like to cook. And I started asking the Lord how I can be a blessing in that area. I saw God move and we've never lacked for, I, I, whatever I set my budget at for good quality food, the Lord has always met for us once I learned the principle of not withholding the rest from God and just what's my best that I can do today. So we have three areas that you can give today. And then after, if you need prayer, we definitely, after our last song, Please come on up. Um, we'd be glad to pray and agree with you today. Um, but yeah, you can give online, you can give via text, and you can give in the offering buckets at the back of the sanctuary. So Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of trusting you in the area of our finances, Father. We thank you that the floodgates are open unto us and, Lord, are going to affect every area um, in our economy, in our families, in our business places, because we're not going to withhold our best from you. So we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. One more song and then we'll go. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on now. Talking about Lord, you are good again.
Business, they 